Okay, I think we are live. Okay, good, good evening, everyone, uh, and when, welcome to the Institute Lecture Series at IIT Roorkee. So this lecture is in continuation to uh, previous two lectures that we have conducted uh, for the Nobel Prize in Physics and Chemistry in 2021. And this one would be delivered by Professor Batsala Tirumalai on the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, that was given this year. This year. I would like to invite uh, Professor Partha to um, introduce our honor guest. Good evening, uh, all the present audience. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Vatsala Tirumalai. I'm welcome to this lecture sessions. We are really happy to have you here among us. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, spell out uh, about uh, the brief introduction of Professor Tirumalai. She is a scientist at Neural Circuits and Developmental Laboratory at National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bangalore. So, uh, she about her educational qualification, she secured B.Tech degree in Biotechnology from Anna University, Chennai, and PhD from in Neuroscience from Brandeis University, Waltham, M.A. USA. Then she did a series of postdoctoral research work at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and National Institute of Health, which is the Maryland, before joining to NCBS in Bangalore. So, uh, basically, uh, Professor Vatsala heads the Neural Circuits and Development Laboratory at NCBS, and whose major focus is on studying the working of neural circuits and cause of physical movements in animals. So, which is very much linked uh, to what this Nobel, this year's Nobel Prize has been awarded to, very close to that. And so, you can imagine that she is really working in a very cutting edge research uh, and very important area in the area of biological sciences. And most importantly, what I was when I was searching about her and looking at her papers and all, I realized that she is an ex real expert in the zebra fish models for doing an experimental experiments. And for the audience, I can just tell the zebra fish is a very important model for studying neuron science, development biology, and all. And uh, biggest advantage of using this model is that uh, it has a, got a transparent body during its development, so that you can virtually see the entire organism as such. So that is why it is a very popular and interesting model to be studied by any neuroscientist, development biologist, even sometimes geneticist, they use this model. Coming back to uh, Professor Vatsala's um, um, this credentials, what she has got, she is an excellent profile. And she is a Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Prize winner for the 2020 in Biological Sciences. So that speaks her a tremendous uh, volume of work she has done uh, over this in this area of neural circuits and neural networks. Other than that, she is recipient of Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance, both intermediate and senior research fellowships, intermediate from 2010 to 2015, and senior one 2018 and till 23. She is continuing with that. So, which actually shows the high command she has has over the science Indian science because this is really a competitive. Um, uh, this uh, awards which are given to extremely important areas of science. So we are really happy to have such an eminent speaker among us for today. So and she's also an intro member of eLife Science, eLife, and she has got some excellent publications in high impact journals, uh, which speaks of her high end research. So with this, I would like to invite uh, Professor Vatsala Thirumalai for this talk. So thank you very much for coming over here again. Or and taking our time from busy schedules to speak to our audience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Partharoy, for such a warm and kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Professor Sriram Yadav, for uh, reaching out to me and inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, I must say that you know this is the first time I'm going to be talking about somebody else's research rather than my own, so it's that much more difficult. Uh, but it's exciting to be talking about this topic and thank you to all other organizers who made sure that uh, this event goes on virtually, even though we have a pandemic situation. I should say that if uh, we didn't have the pandemic, I would have surely loved to come and give this at your campus in Roorkee, beautiful campus it looks like. Um, so with that, let me start my uh, lecture. 
I'll share my screen. Um, and uh, I hope all of you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. So as you may have read in the newspapers, this year's uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology uh, was awarded primarily to the sensation of touch. Um, and the importance of touch is something that you may have uh, realized over these past two years when it's um, become rare for us to have that sensation of touch, you know, shaking hands with other people is, uh, you know, you can't do that because of uh, risk of infection. And even seeing each other and talking to each other in person has now become rare. And um, actually, there is a real fear that because of the loss of human touch uh, communication that, you know, we lack that human company and, uh, you know, shaking hands with each other, hugging each other, all of that thing is uh, now reduced. And, um, and therefore, there is a real uh, fear that this may actually lead to, in the long term, mental health disorders because of isolation. So that aside, um, that is just to tell you, I mean, I didn't want to start my lecture with such a bleak note, but that is just to underline the importance of touch in our everyday life, which we may not realize, you know, as we go about our busy lives. So with that, I will um, start. So this year's, this was the official press release, the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute has today decided to award the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly to Professors David Julius and Adam Pataputian for their discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. So why is this important? So my goal for today is to tell you all why this discovery or these discoveries made by Professors Julius and uh, Pataputian are so significant that they truly deserved a Nobel Prize. Now, we know that we experience the world through our sense organs, our five sense organs, right? Eyes, nose, ears, our tongue, uh, and the feeling of touch with our hands or with our bodies. Um, and these sense organs convey external information from the environment, be it you know, looking at the world around us, smelling it, hearing the sounds, tasting the food, um, or touching the objects around us. Now, when you touch objects around you, there are many things that you feel. You know, you feel whether the object is hot or cold. You feel whether the object is soft or rough to touch. And sometimes you can also feel the pressure exerted by these uh, objects around you. If I place a really heavy objects at the tip of your fingers, you will really feel the pressure as opposed to if I place a feather on top of your fingers. So one sensation of touch actually conveys multiple meanings to us in terms of what objects are we dealing with. Now, sense organs have been richly decorated with Nobel Prizes before. Um, the sense of hearing was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discoveries of uh, George von Bekesi for the physical mechanism of stimulation within the cochlea. How does the cochlea mediate our sense of hearing? That was in 1961. Then in 1967, vision was given a Nobel Prize for the work of Ragnar Granit, Haldon Keffer, Hartline and George Wald for their work on visual transduction, that is within the retina, when the light impinges on the retina, how does it get converted into neural signals? That was the discovery for which these people were given the Nobel Prize in 1967. Then um, there were a series of three Nobels which are related to the senses of smell and taste, separated by many years, of course. So in 1994, Alfred Gilman and Martin Rodbell were given the Nobel Prize for the discovery of G proteins and the role of these proteins in signal transduction in cells. Why is this important? Now, G protein mediated signaling is something that is 
widely important in our bodies, not only for mediating smell and taste, but also for conveying intercellular communication. So when one cell wants to communicate with each other uh, by the release of chemicals, uh, such as, you know, hormonal control, these chemicals then bind to G protein coupled receptors on other cell membranes, and then they convey a signal. And these two people discovered this pathway by which the G protein coupled receptor pathway works, what are the signaling mechanisms and so on. So it, this signaling pathway happens within the uh, sense uh, functions of smell and taste, but it also is important for other important bodily functions. Now in 2004, Richard Axel and Linda Buck received the Nobel Prize again for work on odorant receptors. That is when you smell something, there are receptors uh, in your uh, olfactory pathway that detect these smells and then convert them into electrical signals which then the brain processes. And in 2012, again, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the structure of these G-protein coupled receptors. What is What does the protein look like and how does it work? So now, so we've covered, you know, hearing, vision, smell and taste. And of course, it's, uh, you know, only logical that uh, we also look at the sense of touch. And therefore, in 2021, we've, um, the Nobel Prize has been awarded to um, David Julius and Adam Pataputian for their work on the sense of touch and how it, with the sense of touch you detect even uh, whether an object is hot or cold. Okay, so let's um, look at the uh, discoverers themselves first on uh, David Julius. Now the important thing about both of these people is that they David Julius was born in the US, but his parents uh, were immigrants um, and he did his early education in Brooklyn, New York, and then he obtained his bachelor's in life sciences from MIT, then did his PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and he did his postdoctoral fellowships in uh, Columbia University with Richard Axel. Richard Axel, I just now mentioned, for his Nobel winning work on the odorant receptors. Now, when he was in Richard Axel's lab, he was working on uh, another class of receptors called serotonin receptors. And then he got interested in how the uh, body may sense uh, heat. We'll come into that a little bit later. But after finishing his postdoc with Richard Axel, he moved to the University of California, San Francisco, where he's been faculty uh, from then till now. So what really intrigued David Julius was that, you know, we can sense heat, but how do we sense heat? What is the mechanism by which our cells are able to sense whether something is hot or not? So what was known at that time point was that um, there is this compound. I'll talk more about where it comes from. Uh, this compound is called capsaicin. It is a vanilloid molecule. This uh, box here, uh, you know, outlines the vanilloid moiety. And uh, this capsaicin can cause a burning sensation when it comes in contact with our uh, skin. And um, capsaicin was discovered in 1816 by Christian Buchholz. And chemical composition was determined nearly 100 years later biosynthetic pathways were worked out, but for a very long time, it was also known that you could use this in pain management. Uh, although it causes a burning sensation, then after a while, the capsaicin really reduces uh, pain. And so it was used in a homeopathic treatment. Um, and what was also known was that it was hydrophobic, colorless crystalline compound, and um, that it, it, it can be um, used as a pain management tool. But in spite of all this knowledge, it was not clear how capsaicin causes this burning sensation. Now, we know that um, when you taste chili peppers, right, you feel a burning sensation in your tongue. 
and that burning sensation is actually because of capsaicin and capsaicin was actually identified as the active ingredient in chili peppers. This uh, pepper that I show you here is the Naga ghost pepper or Booth Jolokia. It's a very, very, very spicy pepper. I'll tell you a more interesting quantitative measure of how spicy it is in a little bit. But uh, here are a few tips. If you, you know, if you happen to taste something very, very hot, then what can you do? So number one is that capsaicin because it's hydrophobic, it's fat soluble. So we all know that, right? When you add ghee to some food, then it reduces the spiciness of the food. So you can add ghee to it. Also, when you're using chili peppers, you see this white part in the center, that is the one that contains the capsaicin glands. Um, actually, the seeds are not so spicy themselves. They don't have much capsaicin, but this central white part uh, is the one that's very spicy. So if you cut it and remove it and take it away, and use only the skin, for example, these parts, which is called the um, endocarp and the mesocarp, these parts actually will not be very spicy. The apex, which is the tip of the chili pepper, is also not very spicy. So if you want to taste a pepper and see whether it's very hot or not, you can actually take a bite of the tip of the pepper and it won't do uh, much harm. So there is actually a quantitative scale for how hot peppers are. And this is called the Scoville heat scale. And now, you know, you start with bell peppers, um, which are very, very, very mild. There's nothing uh, at all. Um, and if you go to the Booth Jolokia, which is the Naga pepper, it's actually off the scale. So 100,000 to 500,000 is habanero peppers, which are very hot. And Booth Jolokia is something like a million Scoville units. So you can imagine how hot it is. Uh, and everything else is here, you know, like the jalapeno peppers and so on. So it was widely appreciated, right, that there is this compound capsaicin derived from chili peppers and it causes burning sensation. Uh, but it was not scientifically known how exactly this burning sensation is caused. Now, what we also know simultaneously is that in our skin, we have nerve terminals these are called nociceptors, noci for pain. And these terminals, if they are stimulated by heat, by, for example, if you accidentally happen to touch something hot or put your finger against a burning candle, these nociceptor terminals can conduct these signals into the spinal cord via something called the dorsal root ganglion. This will become very important as we go through the work of uh, David Julius and Adam Pataputian. So these, these nerve terminals are actually one branch of these neurons within the dorsal root ganglion, which is this gray bulge over here, okay? The cell bodies that are within this dorsal root ganglion. One arm goes into the spinal cord and conveys signals. The other arm is the one that's collecting the signal from the skin. Now, what was known was that if you take these dorsal root ganglion cell bodies and you apply capsaicin, and you measure cellular currents. So this black trace over here is a measure of the cellular current. And CAP here stands for capsaicin. You apply capsaicin and a current flows into the cell. That is this downward deflection over here, right? So it was known that capsaicin causes this flow of currents into dorsal root ganglion neurons, but it was not known how he, something like heat can get converted into electric current, right? So that is the quest on which David Julius uh, set forth to find out how the heat sensation or, or, or heat at the end of the nociceptor terminals gets converted into electrical signals. So how did, he, how did David Julius go about this work? So this is the paper that reports this work. Uh, so this is their logic. They said, okay, the receptor is likely to be a membrane protein. Now we all know that cells have an outer covering called a membrane, which is made up of lipids. And in these membranes sit various proteins, which are constantly sensing things from the outside. So if you are to sense heat, you have to be sitting on the outside of the cell where you can be receptive to the heat. So they said, okay, it has to be a membrane protein. And we know that 
this these have to be the dorsal root ganglion neurons and uh, because they are the ones sending the nociceptor terminals to the skin to respond to to sense heat so this must be the part of the nervous system where we have to focus and they reasoned that the dorsal root ganglion cells must have this membrane pro protein at the end at the tips the, the nerve tips that go into this the skin and another fundamental fact in biology is that in order to make any protein you need to make a messenger rna so all of us have dna within our uh, nucleus in each cell there is dna uh, and the dna is read by rna polymerases to make a messenger rna and the messenger rna is then translated to make into protein so it's a two step step process first dna made into mrna and then mrna is made into protein now um, it is very difficult to isolate protein uh, in large quantities and do studies especially for these kinds of experiments it is much easier to isolate mrna so they said okay we will collect mrna from these dorsal root ganglion neurons but then there is a problem the mrna is very unstable it doesn't stay around for very long so you have to convert it into a more stable form and so dna the deoxy form of the nucleic acid is more stable so there are ways to convert mrna into copy dna which is cdna in the lab so that's what they said they will do so collect mrna from all dorsal root ganglion neurons make a copy of it into its dna form and then make libraries okay so every cell is constantly making many 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 thousands of varieties of mrna so you collect all of them and then you make a library of cdna and then you split it into different pools and you inject into cells and ask whether any of these pools become responsive to capsaicin so if the protein that sits on the membrane that senses heat um, is within this pool right then you can detect whether the response is there or not so let's um then how do we how do you test whether something is responsive to capsaicin um you can do it in many ways you can put an electrode into the cell and record its response like i showed you in the previous slide where you measure the current flowing in but you know that's a little bit more labor intensive because you can only do one cell at a time there are methods to look at multiple cells at the same time and that is using um, an imaging technique so you put the cell uh, culture under a microscope and you image the cell and there are sensors most importantly calcium sensors now if we go back you know every time the uh, cell is um, getting an inflow of current the currents can are mediated by inflow of uh, both uh, monovalent and divalent cations including calcium so any current that comes in uh, is likely to increase the calcium levels within the cell normally the calcium level within the cell is very low but when a current is activated by capsaicin then the amount of calcium inside the cell goes up now if you have a sensor in the cell uh, that binds to calcium then what happens is that as soon as capsaicin is put on and the calcium comes in it binds to the sensor and then it glows brighter right and then you can detect it with your microscope so this is how they did the experiment where they took the mrna from the dorsal root ganglion cell converted into cdna now it's still dna you have to make the protein right and so for that they split it into pools and injected into cells in culture in a culture dish and then they waited for the cell to make the protein and then they put the capsaicin on and then they also put the calcium sensor and they saw whether the cells which cells were glowing brighter and which cells were not and here is what they see and of course the control experiments are also very important so the first part is without any mrna uh, converted cdna in the cell so this has no 
cDNA from the uh, dorsal root ganglion cells and therefore there is no response. Blue means there is no response. Warmer color means there is a high response. And then they put different pools of cDNAs. This is one particular pool, the pool number 11. And they saw a few cells light up here and there. See, that's the warmer colors over there. When they put the capsaicin on, the cells became active. And you read that out as a calcium fluorescence. And then they took this particular pool and then they split it again and split it again and split it again until they were left with one uh, mRNA species uh, which caused widespread activation and that was the VR1 cDNA. This is akin to, you know, taking a um, whole uh, library of books and sorting through them until you find that one book that is what you're looking for or the relevant book that you're lo looking for. So that is how they arrived at one particular uh, molecule that activates the cells within the dorsal root ganglion. Now this is with capsaicin. When they put the capsaicin on, see, without capsaicin, there is no response in the last panel. But when capsaicin is put on, these cells glow brighter, showing that they are responsive to the capsaicin and therefore they must contain the receptor for the uh, VR1, uh, uh, capsaicin. And that is the VR1 cDNA. Now, I also showed you that capsaicin um, and heat should be the, uh, mediated by the same receptor, right? Because both produce a sensation of burning. And so this is what they tested over here, whether VR1 can also mediate the sensation of heat. So here again, it's uh, no cDNA from the dorsal root ganglion cell. Same culture plus heat, there is not much response. But here is the culture with the VR1 cDNA in, injected into the cells. They are making the VR1 protein and the VR1 protein gets activated when the culture gets heated up. So then they surmised that VR1 must be the membrane protein that mediates a sensation of burning. So what is this VR1? The beauty of molecular biology is that once you have the cDNA, you can uh, sequence it. And then you can also look at the protein counterpart for it because we know the genetic code for ev every triplet codon, which is, you know, you have ATGC and so on. You can uh, read that genetic sequence into a protein sequence because these are universal rules and you can look at okay this triplet codon codes for this amino acid and so on so it's possible to translate from the cdna to the protein structure and now pro by protein structure i mean the protein amino acid sequence now when you have the amino acid sequence you can also predict the structure of the protein what it may look like because you know amino acids come in different flavors some are hydrophilic some are hydrophobic and um, because the membrane is made up of lipids it most likely contains hydrophobic residues so it's possible to use these uh, properties to predict which will be present within the membrane which will be present on the cytoplasmic side and so on and you can also look for similarity in different species from humans to um, rats and uh, drosophila flies and so on. So that's what they did here. So on the left hand side, this is the amino acid sequence of VR1. Um, I'll come to what a trip channel is in a, in a little bit. But this here in single letters, each letter represents one amino acid. Uh, and this is the sequence in which the different amino acids are present. And it's about uh, 838 amino acid long uh, protein. It's a long chain. And the black here are the transmembrane regions, which means they span the membrane. And uh, they have this loop-like structure as shown here on the right-hand side. And here is its conservation among different species showing that this protein really does a very important function. That's why lots of animals uh, have conserved it and they use it for the function of sensing heat. Now, what is a trip channel? A trip channel is a transient receptor potential channel. 
it was originally discovered in the fruit fly drosophila um, and the reason they named it transient receptor potential was that this was identified in a particular mutant drosophila uh, which was unable to produce uh, long-lasting visual responses. There is visual responses were all transient and therefore they said okay this drosophila which has a mutated version of a channel which leads to transient visual responses this is how they name things in drosophila you know the name is actually the mutated phenotype or the mutated uh, behavioral trait that they see uh, for example shaker channels are potassium ch there are large classes of potassium channels called shaker channels and it comes from uh, mutant drosophila which uh, show you know shaking of their bodies um, so here it's called transient receptor potential channels because when mutated in drosophila it leads to transient uh, responses and subsequent to this discovery in drosophila uh, trip channels have been uh, shown to mediate a lot of sensing a lot of different things such as pain temperature different kinds of taste pressure vision in insects and so on and so forth so because the VR1 cDNA was uh, shown to encode a TRIP channel, this channel was then renamed trip v one okay, for veniloid 1 because capsaicin is a veniloid uh, molecule. Okay, so that is for heat. Subsequently, David Julius's group and Ardim Patapujian's group both discovered channels for cold. So if there are receptors for heat, then there should be receptors for cold as well. Um, and for this, they used menthol. We all know that when we take a menthol mint, you know, you feel really cold in your mouth, right? How does that sensation come about? So again, there, were, uh, there was a paper in 2001, slightly before when Julius and uh, Pataputian published their study. Reed and Flonta showed that the same dorsal root ganglion neurons. So there are different varieties of dorsal root ganglion neurons. Not all neurons sense the same thing. So they were able to find neurons within the DRG that responded to menthol. So don't worry about all the different uh, traces I'm showing here. I would like you to focus on this top left graph here, right? So the y-axis is voltage and the x-axis is time. And when menthol is applied, then these neurons respond with spiking. And they also respond when the temperature is lowered, right? When you lower the temperature down, then these res neurons respond uh, a lot with spike. So it was known that DRG neurons uh, respond, some DRG neurons are capable of responding to menthol as well as to cold temperatures. And the question again was, how is this mediated? So David Julius and colleagues used the same um, work uh, flow, which is to you know take mRNA from the DRG neurons, make libraries of cDNA, and then test it for menthol response. And they identified one particular clone which responded to the menthol that is shown here. So here is a current response, right? Again, it may uh, mediates an inflow of current into the cell. Um, and, you know, it also mediates an inflow of current when the cell is cooled down. So here is temperature going down and as it's either slowly cooled down or in the red is rapidly cooling down uh, and on the top here is the response of the cell, there is a current that flows into the cell, okay. And this was mediated by one particular clone of cDNA isolated from the dorsal root ganglion cells and that clone was named trip m1 for menthol um, so this is the cold receptor now simultaneously uh, adam patapuchin's lab also discovered a sensor the same trip m m1 molecule through a different strategy what they did was they took the trip v1 sequence and they um, reasoned that you know the sensor for cold should also be similar to a trip channel with a slight bit of modification you can turn a, a heat sensing molecule into a cold sensing molecule so, so they looked for um, proteins in the database that are similar 
to trip v1 but are hitherto unknown what their function is and so like this they isolated some candidates and then they did gene silencing so this is another nobel uh, winning uh, you know uh, work okay so they looked for these uh, trip m8 molecules and they uh, sorry the, the similarity with the trip v1 and they uh, looked for responses using calcium imaging and they showed that these cells with trip m uh, m1 or m8 uh, different classes of the cold sensing molecules reacted to the cold and to menthol by showing an increase in fluorescence so cho is just chinese hamster ovary these are cells in culture that they are testing uh, either with cold say the cold signal or with menthol and they showed that when the trip m8 molecule is present then these cells glow brighter right so both of these groups simultaneously reported receptors for cold sensing initially david julius's group called them uh, cmr1 for cold and menthol receptor 1 but later it was renamed trip m1 and then the body of work from julius's lab then uh, showed that we have proteins that sense temperatures at different ranges so vr1 is for mild heat okay our normal body temperature is somewhere around here 37 degrees celsius um, and so anything a little bit warmer than that vr1 can sense uh, we are like one or we are L1 is another class of heat sensors for noxious heat, very, very hot, um, 50, 60 degrees and so on. And CMR1 or TRIP M1 is the cold sensing protein which activates at less than body temperatures to tell us that it is cold. So this body of work then showed us how the sense of heat from outside heat or cold from the environment is transduced into electrical signals by the sensory neurons which is then relayed to the brain um, and then we can get the conscious awareness of hot or cold now that brings us to the summary of this part of the work which um, showed that you know you have uh, trip v1 molecules which sense heat and trip m8 molecules which uh, sense cold and there are different flavors of trip uh, m's you know trip m2 trip m8 trip m1 and so on and they are range fractionated you know they sense temperatures at different ranges um, so this is about temperature now let's move to the next part of the talk which is about the sensation of pressure and this work was done by Adam, Adam Pataputian's lab. And Adam Pataputian was born in Beirut, Lebanon. And then he emigrated to USA as a young teen. And uh, he did his bachelor's in biology from UCLA, uh, then PhD at Caltech. And he was a postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco. And after finishing his postdoc, he uh, got a job as a faculty at Scripps Research Institute, where he continues to be till date. And he has also received funding from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for his work. Okay, so what uh, discoveries did um, Adam Pataputian do, apart from the cold sensing uh, receptor work? So they used so the, what what Adam Pataputian was interested in uh, understanding was receptors for pressure, uh, light touch or heavy pressure. What is the receptor that tells you um, how much mechano sensation you're receiving from outside, right? I mean, we're all used to working with mechano sensors and mechano transducers uh, in our daily life, you know, be it our touchpad or our mouse clicks, all of these things use pressure to we use that device to communicate with the computer but how is that how is it that our brain knows how much pressure it is receiving whether something is painful or something is pleasurable some 
forms of light touch are pleasurable, right? Like when someone strokes your um, like pets, like really uh, scratching and stroking them if you have a dog. Um, and, uh, you know, some things are noxious, like when you're trying to drive a nail into the wall and you accidentally hit your fingertips, you know how painful that is. So, so the amount of pressure that lands on our uh, organs determines whether something is going to be painful or pleasurable. How does our brain know how much pressure it is? Where are these mechanosensors and what, how do they work? That is what Adam wanted to find out. So the way um, they went about this was to use gene silencing. This again is a Nobel winning uh, uh, technology that was inspired by how animals use gene silencing to control what proteins are expressed and what proteins are not expressed. Now, if you remember earlier on in the lecture, I talked about DNA, which is present inside the nucleus. And the DNA is read into mRNA or messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is then translated into protein. Now, gene silencing is a method by which once the mRNA is made, it can be silenced so that it doesn't go on to make protein. And how do you do that? So externally, if an experimenter wants to do it, they will apply what are known as siRNA um, or, uh, you know, interfering RNAs, which are double-stranded RNAs, which get into the cell and then they assemble into complexes, signaling complexes called risk complexes. And these risk complexes can then bind, bind to mRNA of interest. Now, what determines which mRNA is going to be silenced? That depends on the sequence of the silencing RNA that you're injecting. So you can engineer siRNAs to be, these are short interfering RNAs. You can engineer siRNAs to target specific mRNA so that other mRNAs are not affected. See, if you shut down protein synthesis altogether in the cell, the cell is going to become sick and it's not going to survive because cells need proteins to function. So if you want to understand what a particular protein is doing in the cell, you want to just stop that particular protein from being made. And how do you do that? You make the siRNA sequence to be matching to the sequence of the mRNA and then of that protein that you're interested in. And then you inject it into the cell. The siRNA binds to the mRNA after being processed by the risk complex. And then because of this binding, the mRNA is now no longer available for the protein synthesis machinery. So no protein is being made. So this is the technology that they used. And what um, the strategy that they used was that First, they screened several cell lines, cultured cells, um, to look for a cell line that responds to applied positive or negative pressure. And for this, what they did was they used a piezoelectric device. A piezoelectric device is uh, something that can transduce uh, applied electrical signals to movement, right? And it comes from the Greek word piece meaning to squeeze. Uh, so you have a piezoelectric probe and you can use that to poke or gently nudge cells. It's a blunt one. You don't want to poke the cell through, but you just want to apply pressure on the outside without damaging the cell. So they had this piezoelectric probe and simultaneously they were using another electrode to poke into the cell and look at electrical signals. And they asked, okay, if I apply pressure, is the cell responding in any manner? Once they identified a cell line that responds to applied pressure, then they injected these uh, siRNAs for different proteins into the cells. And then they asked whether they can abolish the pressure response. So the logic is that, you know, if the short interfering RNAs that they're targeting to different kinds of proteins, ends up targeting one mechanosensitive uh, protein, then that mechanosensitive protein will no longer be made. And if the mechanosensitive protein is no longer made, then the cell will stop responding to pressure. So that is the logic. So they tested as many as 73 candidates, right? 
So here is a summary of all their uh, experiments here on the right hand side. So these are all cells where the response is still present. So on the x-axis is the amount of current they observed. And there is one particular candidate that's shown here in red, where after injecting the siRNA, the cell response became smaller, right? So that means that this particular siRNA is targeting a uh, mRNA that codes for a mechanosensitive protein, okay? So that's shown here in these traces. So on top is the natural response of the cell line. So here is the piezoelectric probe. Here is the pipette that's recording the currents. And here is the amount of pushing that they are doing to the cell on the y-axis is, you know, uh, taller the step sizes, the more they are pushing the cell. And the more they push the cell, the larger the cellular current that they see. Okay, these are the cellular currents here in the bottom. Now they take this cell and they apply the, this candidate SIRNA 73 or 72 and the cell response is abolished. Now they take the same SIRNA sequence and they scramble it up. They rearrange the nucleic acid bases so it no longer matches to the, the mRNA sequence that they are interested in. The matching is gone. So the um, cell is now uh, not um, or, or the cell is still making the mechanosensitive protein. So the mechanosense sensor is active and you get a response, continue to get a response here, right? So with that is the control to show that, you know, this is really a specific effect on the mechanosensor protein synthesis. With the siRNA, the mechanosensor is not made, but with the scrambled sequence, the mechanosensor is made and you get a response. Here the response is abolished, okay? So then again, they did the uh, bioinformatics analysis. They looked at the sequence of the mRNA that was being targeted by the this particular candidate number 73 siRNA and they named it piezo. As I said, you know, piezo is derived from the Greek word PAC, which means to squeeze or press. And they showed that these are channels that are quite unlike any other channel that was known before. And, um, you know, piezos are present all over uh, the uh, uh, kingdom, both plant and animal kingdom. Plants also have piezo proteins. Animals also have piezo proteins. Mammals have two copies of piezo proteins. And um, they perform a wide variety of functions. We'll go to that in a little bit. Um, but what um, Pataputin and colleagues showed was that, you know, these proteins are really multifunctional, but mostly they are used for as mechanosensors to sense pressure or uh, light touch. Now, the two piezo proteins that they discovered initially were named piezo 1 and piezo 2. Um, as you can see on this right hand side graph here, both piezo 1 and piezo 2 are widely expressed in a number of different tissues, as you will see. So bladder is urinary bladder. Uh, it's uh, expressed, piezo 2 is expressed in dorsal root ganglion cells, but piezo 1 is not. But both uh, piezo 1 and piezo 2 are expressed in other organs like the bladder and the lung. Okay. In addition, piezo 1 is also expressed in skin. So um, then the question was, what functions do these piezo proteins serve? And since the time of this original discovery in 2010, this field has really exploded, both uh, because of work from uh, Pataputian's lab, as well as his own uh, postdocs and students who have now gone on to establish their own labs. And they are doing more work on piezo proteins, you know, its function, its structure and so on and so forth. So I'm go just going to briefly go over what we know already about the piezo protein functions. Um, so this is one interesting paper that came out actually this year, which shows that piezo proteins in plants are actually important for root extension. Um, so, okay. So here um, on the left-hand side 
is showing the presence of piezo proteins at root trip tips. You see these dark blue stains uh, that shows the presence of piezo mRNA in the root tips of Arabidopsis plants. Okay, and the bottom here shows you know wild type Arabidopsis plants which make nice roots into the media. These long roots. Okay, that's these uh, on the left hand side of this picture. On the right hand side of this picture, you can see plants which have mutated piezo 1 and you can see that they make shorter roots. Now, when roots are growing into the substrate, they need to sense, right, uh, whether something is soft and they can grow through it or if it is hard, then they have to grow around it. And if you don't have the piezo proteins, then it becomes difficult to sense the uh, how much um, these how hard these substances are and whether the roots can grow further or not and this is how the piezo proteins transduce mechanical stimuli to electrical stimuli in plants you know we all know that we as human beings you know our nervous systems use electricity but here is an example of how plants use electricity to convey signals about their environment using the piezo proteins and that's not all. Um, so here is uh, another paper from the Pataputian group where they showed that piezo 2 mediates sensation of light touch. So first they showed that the piezo 2 is present in the different nerve terminals in the skin, innervating the pores and innervating the skin all over the body, right? So if you focus on this picture, GFP is where um, the piezo proteins are and these are various markers for different uh, nerve terminals you can uh, ignore that for the moment but look at this row of pictures on the left hand side most uh, panel where you can see gfp signals within the nerve terminals so piezo2 is there in the nerve terminals on the skin next what they did was they made a skin uh, explant with the nerve attached to it and they applied again Mechano, mechano, uh, mechanical probes onto the skin to push the skin and they recorded the responses of the nerves and here you can see so bottom here this line here is the stimulus that they are applying you know uh, and the uh, scale bar here shows 20 millinewtons so you're applying a light pressure and the nerve is responding with a series of impulses okay um, and in the piezo 2 knockout that response is reduced okay so this shows that the piezo 2 is important for uh, converting mechanical stimulus to electrical impulses and so this is at the level of the nerve what happens in behavior so they looked at the knockout mice so they knocked out the piezo 2 gene from the mouse and they asked how what what kind of behaviors these mice uh, display so even if you touch them lightly on the foot paw, wild type mice or you know normal mice will withdraw it if you just you know stroke the underside of the paw and that's shown here on this graph on the right hand side. So the white bar is normal uh, wild type mice which have a functional piezo 2 uh, and they show about 60-70% withdrawal of their uh, paw when you're stroking it with a cotton swab. Now, when the piezo 2 is knocked out, that response goes down, telling you that even light touch responses with cotton swabs, you need piezo 2 to mediate that sensation, right? So, this is light touch, but since then, there have been a number of different stud studies, both, uh, as I said, from within um, uh, part of Putin's group as well as from his trainees and from other labs. Uh, number one, you know, they showed that it's important for proprioception. What is proprioception? See, when you close your eyes, you still know where your limbs are. How do you know that? Because you have sensors in each of your joints which tell you where your limbs are. That tells the information to the brain. That is proprioception and it helps you move around in the world. Uh, without proprioception, it becomes very, very difficult to manage your movements in the world because you can't be constantly looking at where your feet are when you're walking. Actually, there are patients, you know, who because of 
mutations um, they lack proprioception and for them it makes a world of difference whether they are actually looking at their limbs or not and that's why i have this link here let's um, i will i will show you this video tell me if you can uh, see it let me get out of uh, this presentation mode for now yeah and uh, let's go here here is the video uh, i hope you can see this uh, screen so here is a patient who has a mutated uh, piezo 2 and this patient is now blindfolded this patient walks around normally when they are uh, when their eyes are open but now look at how they are walking when their eyes are closed they are on a harness so that they don't fall down the falling is actually quite real right and when their eyes are closed their limbs are actually quite wavering in air they are not even able to keep their limbs steady in one position and as you can see in this patient you know they the the hands are wavering and simple tasks which we can do with eyes closed you can try it now you know you close your eyes and try to touch the nose from and a target in front of you and you can do this quite well but in patients who don't have this piezo 2 protein uh, they are unable to do that uh, when their eyes are closed so I'll, I'll i'll stop it there and get back into my presentation um, so so proprioception is something very important and that is mediated by uh, piezo 2 shown here is piezo 2 again look focus on the left hand side panel in green that is piezo 2 present in the sensors within our um, muscles which are muscle spin spindles and golgi tendon or organs which tell you how where our limbs are and how contracted our muscles are so these sensors help us uh, help tell us where our limbs are and the piezo 2 mediates this function and another important function is urination to tell you how full your bladder is there are piezo 2 sensors on the wall walls of the urinary bladder and uh, that tells you how full the bladder is it's it, an internal sensation which is quite important and that again is driven by piezo 2 airway stretch you know how full your lungs are that is again mediated by piezo 2 present on uh, sensory nerve endings within the airways in the lung so these are some of the important functions mediated by this piezo 2 channel and um, lastly the structure for piezo 2 has also been solved um, it has this blade tri blade like structure but it's still not clear exactly how pressure opens this channel so that's what it does right when you apply pressure the channel opens and lets in positive ions into the cell causing an inward current but how exactly it happens is not known there are some ideas for how this may be happening one idea is that you know these uh, blades are actually pointing up and when pressure is applied then the blades kind of turn and the turning opens just like a screw cap this turning opens the pore the pore is in the middle and then the ions flow through another theory is that when pressure is applied the upwardly curved blades flatten out like this shown in this cartoon here this cartoon here on the right hand side and the flattening of the blades opens the pore, pore and then ions flow in uh, of course at this time point we don't know which of these is correct but uh, suffice it to say that this tri blade structure is very important for mediating the function of the channel so um, to summarize then for this part of the talk uh, the discovery of piezo 1 and piezo 2 mechanosensors mediating touch mediating proprioception mediating many other functions throughout the animal kingdom uh, earned Professor Pataputian his Nobel share of the Nobel Prize. Um, and to summarize both discoveries, so we saw about TRIP V1, which is a heat sensor, and the TRIP M channels, which are cold sensors. We saw about piezo 2 channels uh, and piezo 1 channels, which are mechanosensors. 
which mediate uh, sensations of touch, proprioception, mechanical pain, urination, respiration, and so on. And both of these discoveries together enhance our understanding of how we sense with our touch sensors. So with that, I think I will uh, wrap up. These are some of the key publications I talked about today um, in terms of both the uh, discoveries from the Julius lab as well as from the Pataputian lab. I urge you to go and look at these papers if at all you are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vatsala. Um, now I request Professor Pravindra to provide the word of thanks. Oh, um, we can also take a few questions if we have any questions actually before that. I see um, attendees can uh, put down their questions in the chat. Okay, uh, I request Professor Pravindra. Uh, I think uh, uh, if there, if, uh, Professor, is there any question on the chat box? No, if there is no question on the chat box. Okay, so I have I have couple of things I would like to clarify because I got this opportunity to interact with such an eminent scientist, so I cannot control my <laughs> uh, curiosity to know something about. So uh, this uh, PSO2 uh, uh, receptor that you have been talking about. Uh, so uh, what is basically what regulates the expression of these uh, receptors in a cell? Uh, if you can just take some lights. Definitely, definitely. Very, very nice question. Very good question. So um, when neurons are born, uh, they are born with uh, certain identities um, and it's still not clear, you know, what makes a sensory neuron versus what makes a motor neuron and so on. But it is generally believed that, you know, when, when the neuron is uh, born in the dorsal root ganglion, for example, the uh, expression of, you know, different um, uh, proteins, channels and so on is regulated by the identity of the neuron itself, which is you know, dictated both by its birth date, when it is born, and the signals it is receiving at that time point. So, once the neuron is designated as a sensory neuron of a certain kind, then it expresses, you know, either, you know, uh, channels like TRIPV1 or so on, or, you know, it can, it can uh, express uh, the uh, piezo channels and so on. So, the exact mechanisms by which you know what neuron a certain neuron will become not yet clear at all but you know the identity is what determines what channels it will express sorry i can't hear you you are muted Parth. professor partha <clears throat> yeah so the models uh, that uh, the disease condition that you showed for the piezo uh, receptor so what is was it a mutation in the receptor or what was it yeah, it was a mutation in the piezo two channel. Okay, the receptor was it's blocked itself. Right, 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 right. And what about when I talk about the thermal sensors uh, or temperature sensors that you talk about? Uh, so, is there any difference in the expression patterns of these genes uh, in the animals, or, or, or say I would say animals as such, uh, living in different climatic conditions, or it is globally, uh, universally expressed, or something like that? What is it? How does it happen? In terms, so, so your question is if if different animals that live in different temperatures yes. mm -hmm. will express different kinds of um, receptors and absolutely that is true. Uh, you know, animals are adapted to living in different temperature conditions. So what we would sense as noxious or not noxious, you know, depends uh, number one on our own body temperature as well as the differential with the outside. So definitely these uh, receptors are uh, the, the, there are variations, you know, in terms of what temperature ranges they detect in different animals based on what temperature ranges they live in. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So, um, 
Thank you very much. There are many yeah. questions on chat box, I think. Professor. Then I have one question if... Yeah, uh, Professor Shriram, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, uh, what's up? So, in plants also, we have this sensation of touch in some plant species like... Right, one mimosa, species, yeah. Right? yeah. Chuyumoyi, what is mimosa? So, right. So uh, there the mechanism is more kind of uh, which involves mechanosense to ion channels. Right. So how much that mechanism is similar with the animal uh, yeah. sensation? And is there any significant difference? Are, are, are these proteins which are present in, in animal system, can they also have some kind of uh, uh, similar uh, homologs or orthologs in plants? You know, unfortunately, I don't know much about what ion channels mediate the uh, sense of touch in mimosa. Mm -hmm. I interacted with uh, Professor Baskar in IIT Madras, who's actually studying uh, mm -hmm. this. And I think he mentioned that GABA was one of the regulators that he, uh, uh, you know, showed that could mediate this uh, mechanoreception in mimosa. But I'm okay. not entirely sure what exactly mediates uh, this in uh, my Mosa. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so we have a couple of questions in chat now. So I'll just yeah. quickly summarize. Um, so one of the students, Sumit, is asking if there is any uh, sequence difference between TRP V1 and TRP M1. And if so, does the function change by that change in amino acid? Right. So absolutely, there are differences. So when I said, you know, they look the when I described the Pataputian study, uh, when they discovered also the tripamate in uh, in the same time as the David Julius group, what they were looking for is similarity only in the transmembrane region. The transmembrane region is something that inserts the channel into the lipid region, but the sensation itself is because of you know, the uh, regions that are exposed to the outside as well as the cytoplasmic tail. So there are many regions within the protein that are very different between V1 and uh, the menthol sensitive cold uh, receptor neurons, receptor proteins um, that endow the protein with temperature sensitivity in different ranges. Absolutely, the sequences are different. What was the second part of the question? Um, yeah, so are they, um, the, the change in this amino acid, is that responsible for the change in the function or it's more of a structural thing? So the change in the amino acid sequence actually determines the change in the structure also in terms of how the protein folds and also it determines the interactions that are, so one of the mechanisms proposed for the trip V1 for heat sensation is uh, formation of hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions between different amino acids which are then broken by heat. Now the mechanism for cold sensation is not yet known but okay. one can imagine that changing the amino acid sequence will result in different properties of these van der Waals interactions that can be preferentially maintained or broken as the temperature is varied. Um, I don't think we know the mechanism of how that happens yet. Okay, um, there's another question. It says that some people don't feel heat sensation after certain age. So does that mean that the heat receptors got damaged or they are worn out? Some people don't feel so heat after sensation certain... after they've aged. Yeah, so some yeah. Is there any uh, loss of heat sensation? First of all, the first part would be, is there any loss of heat sensation after a particular age? Well, I have not come across that, but, um, you know, the loss of heat sensation uh, could be because of loss of nerve terminals, which can happen, you know, when there is damage, for example, with uh, diabetic neuropathy, where nerve terminals are damaged, that can happen. Um, it can ha also happen with the neurodegeneration if the neurons themselves die. Uh, but most often it happens because of the terminals uh, being damaged because of systemic damage or metabolic damage and so on. Okay. Uh, and there is one last question. Um, what happens in the case of people who have hallucinations of touch? <laughs> mm, that, that's a very interesting question. 
so if you remember the cartoon that I showed you, the touch sensation originates, you know, peripherally and then it's carried by the sensory endings into the dorsal root ganglion and then into the spinal cord. But once it reaches the spinal cord, you know, these uh, sensory neurons make a lot of synaptic connections and then the senses are carried forward into the brain. Um, and, you know, the hallucinations are because the percept of touch is being created even without the sensory neuron firing and sending the information to the brain. The brain itself constructs these sensations. It could be sensation of touch, it could be sensation of hearing when people um, like in schizophrenia, they uh, hear voices. So sensory percepts are actively created by the brain and that can happen with any modality. When people talk about seeing visions, for example, um, or hearing voices or sensation of touch, all of these things can be created by our brain itself. And that's one of the leading reasons for hallucinations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that's all we have in terms of questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very thank nice you. session. <coughs> Professor uh, Jitin. So this is uh, now my turn to give a vote of thanks. So Professor Vatsala, it gives me an immense pleasure to you know, propose a vote of thanks on behalf of IIT Rurki and on my behalf for giving such a wonderful uh, you know, lecture today. It was such a crystal clear lecture. All the students, I think, even from engineering background, must have understood each and everything. I was listening throughout, and it was each and everything was so crystal clear, like any undergraduate students can understand from any branch. So this was amazing. Thank you so much for taking out time, and we're really uh, grateful for that. I also uh, thankful to our all the audiences, students, and our institute lecture organizing committee members. Uh, Professor Siram, Professor Anil Gorishetti, also Professor Jitin for coordinating this seminar. Professor Partharai, who found found out time for introducing and then still is sitting and asking questions. He's our Dean of Alumni Affairs. So a lot of time. So thank you, Professor Partharai. And I also thank uh, our ICC uh, Institute Computer Center for wide publicity. And I thank all, all and all here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You were saying something, Professor Pindra? No, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was very happy to see this lecture yeah. and then very nicely. I mean, it was really, uh, you know, this word of thanks was not an official word of thanks. It was real. <laughs> it was an amazing lecture. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The actual lecture was so lucid and so interesting. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, very nice. Thank, thank you, Professor Vatsala. Thank so Thanks a lot, thank Professor. You. Thank you, Professor Vatsala. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you. So, can I log out? Yeah. Jitin, yeah. so yeah. you can officially uh, stop here. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I think, Keshav, you can also stop the YouTube live for now. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you all. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you all.